as you know, I chair the Food and Drink Board um, for Wales. So I thought you might just appreciate a few comments on what we've been doing during the coronavirus crisis. Ultimately, our role is to connect with food and drink businesses in Wales and to make sure we listen to what they have to say and represent their views when we're speaking to Welsh Government. We've been having initially daily meetings um, where we've discussed and prioritised what the issues are, and then we've been relaying those to the Minister. Um, and it's really important that we try to prioritise the time um, and the issues and the actions to both the Minister and her team. Ultimately, we've been communicating back to business. And one example of that is the weekly newsletter. So hopefully you've been receiving it. If you haven't, um, please sign up to it. It's a very succinct newsletter. It focuses on the information that hopefully you need at this vital time. So what's the purpose of today? Well, the whole premise of this session is about highlighting the importance of business to operating high standards to minimise the risk of coronavirus spreading to workforce and indeed spreading beyond the workforce. We all know that recent outbreaks in the food premises across Wales, we've all heard about that, we've all read about it. And the focus has very been much on food manufacturing, but it's really important that we as a sector really stand up to scrutiny. We're very mindful of the very real possibility that actually there could be further outbreaks, not just in food business, but also in the community. So if you're in any doubt, just think Leicester. We all know what's happening in Leicester at the moment. So I'd really like you to take three things from the meeting today. Firstly, I need you please to have a greater understanding of where to go for information should you want clarification on the rules. I work in business, I know the rules change. It's very difficult keeping on top of those. So we want to signpost where the information is. Second thing, we want to really highlight the importance of implementing safeguards. Thirdly, we need to be clear about who you should contact if you're concerned, if you have a problem. I'll talk later on about the agility and our speed of reaction. That's vital. And in all the outbreaks that we've had so far, it's the speed of reaction that's been crucial. So in terms of how we're going to run the call today, there's upwards of about 250 people on the call. So please, can you bear with us? Because that's quite a challenging number to manage. First thing I would say is, please, can you keep your phones muted? Secondly, I'm very sorry, but we won't be able to take any oral questions purely because of the numbers. But we are interested in your questions. So what I'd ask you to do is please use the chat function on the right hand side of your screens. Or indeed, if you've got a question later on, please email us. But what we will do is we will endeavour to get to many questions as we can and certainly cover the ones that everybody seem to be asking the themes. But we will get back to everybody with answers after this okay that's our undertaking we're not fudging any questions we will get back to each of you and copy that to everybody so we have a complete record um just to make the note that actually this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online so we can share the joy with everybody but that's important because if you missed anything or wanted to go back you can go and have a look later on and finally apologize um but we have no welsh translation facilities available today. Okay, so in a minute, I'll pass over to the Minister, then David, then Martin, and this will be followed by the Q&A session, and we'll leave plenty of time for that, and we will finish dot on four o'clock. So, finally, I have a fourth message, and I think it's important to recognise that I know that many of us in business in the food and drink sector have been affected in many ways. And for those who have been quite polarised ways, so we know for some people, you've seen an increase in sales. For other people, for other people it's been very much business as usual. And for some people, it's been frankly hell. And we just want to recognise that whichever you've been in, we know that it's been a very difficult situation and we've been doing our best. And I know our colleagues in the Welsh Government have been doing their best. And I think it's important to recognise that the work that the Minister, Leslie Griffiths, and her excellent team in Welsh Government have been doing to support the industry at this time. Because I know we've been working long hours, but believe you me, they have as well. So thank you for their support. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, our Minister for Environment, Energy and Rural Affairs, Leslie Griffiths, to the virtual stage. So over to you, Leslie. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andy, and uh, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, it's, a, it's a real opportunity as well for me to say a public thank you to you, Andy, and to all the board members for all the work that uh, you do on our behalf and for us. Um, also to the, to the team, and you will have heard Andy just say, uh, you know, to the fabulous food division team who have just, uh, as <laughs> some of them have been texting me at midnight, they know who they are when I shouted at them, but, you know, again, uh, everyone's working really long hours and also to to the Food Innovation Wales, to David and Martin, um, who have done the review of the sector for us. I thought it was a really opportune time to do that and I'm looking forward to their presentation uh, later on. And to you all as, as food and drink producers, um, it's been a real pleasure for the last four years to be the Minister with Responsibility for Food and Drink. Uh, it's a very, very easy sell. And it's been really interesting to see the innovation that you've brought forward uh, over the, the last three months or so. And I'll probably say a little bit more about that later uh, as we've been trying to come to terms with uh, the new normal and the uh, lockdown measures that we've had uh, with COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Andy mentioned the two outbreaks and the incident we have at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, one of them, Rowan Foods, is in my own constituency. So uh, that's been very difficult and is still difficult. You will have seen the increase in number of positive tests uh, today. There's a lot of misinformation around. I'm getting it from all directions and it's about making sure that we have the right information, weeding out the misinformation. Um, Andy referred to, to Leicester. I've had lots of constituents contact me because they're very fearful that Wrexham will be the next Leicester. Fortunately, in such word, we haven't seen the significant community transmission um, so we do hope it's contained, but because of the outbreaks and the incident, that was why uh, we thought it really important to do a review of the sector. I also think, you know, as food producers, factories, um, you know, people working in the food industry, we have worked all the way through the pandemic and other factories and plants can look to us, I think, because there are obviously lots of um, uh, plants and factories that haven't had any uh, positive cases at all. So I think, you know, when, when other factories and plants open up, they can look to us for best practice. And of course, there is that best, best practice available. Um, so if you think about where we were uh, ahead of the uh, pandemic, we had just reached or well, exceeded our target of £7 billion by the end of 2020. Uh, we'd exceeded it by quite a significant amount, and I was really pleased to announce that at the back of uh, last year. We've seen a huge increase in our exports, and we've seen the success of the cluster. I think cluster policy is, is a brilliant policy, and it's really been engaged and used to very good effect by the food and drink uh, sector. It never ceases to amaze me how people really want to come together. They forget competition and they just get on with it. So I think it's been a real success for Wales. We've also had Project Helix, which um, is run out of uh, food, Innovative, food Innovation Wales. And I'm sure many of you on the line will have benefited from support uh, and uh, looked for not just short term, but long, medium and long term support from Project Helix. And one of the things I've been really to see with another part of the portfolio hat on is the environment, environmental impact and the work that's been done around that. But of course, we saw in Mar you know, March the 23rd came and the food service closed down and that created many, many problems and is still creating many problems uh, for us. But of course, in problems and, ch and, and challenges, there's always opportunities. And so I suppose I, I, this is what I meant when I referred to um, that innovation uh, by so many of our food and drink producers. And I've spoken to, to quite a few of you who've said to me, you know, the, the internet work has just uh, exploded and you're, you're all doing really well there. So it's great to see uh, that. And we want to continue to look at that as we look to the future. Um, if I could just say a little bit about a bit more about the meat processing. So I mentioned uh, Rowan, because obviously that's the one I I know uh, best because it's in my own constituency. There's also been the outbreak in Tlangevny at Two Sisters and the incident at Keepak in Merthyr Tydfil and, and they're very different 
Um, but we are responding as a government. Uh, well, obviously it's cross-government. It's led by Vorgethin, my colleague, the Minister of Health and Social Services. But it's also done in partnership with Food Standards Agency and with the Health and Safety Executive. So certainly in Rowan Foods Health and Safety Executive were in last week for two days and they're going back in next week for two days. So please be assured that uh, there's a, a lot of partnership working. We're working very closely with Public, uh, Public Health Wales and local authorities as well. And there's an outbreak team. Uh, working in each area. So I think the food industry's you know, got really well established practices to uh, minimise that cross contamination within its production lines and amongst its staff. And that's been recognised by public health authorities during the investigations. The trade unions are also involved as well. And uh, we meet uh, quite regularly. And obviously, uh, as the minister with responsibility for food and drink, I am involved in those discussions as well. So I mentioned that um, you know, online sales have really increased during the pandemic. We've also seen people far keener, I think, to buy local. So if you think about that panic buy-in that we saw in the beginning uh, in our supermarkets, um, I think people uh, were very fearful in the beginning and uh, we saw that around certain products. But then after that, I think we saw people not wanting to go to the supermarkets very much and much preferring to use independent shops. So what I'm really keen to look at is how we can lock in that behaviour. And it's not, not just around food and drink, but going over to the environment part of the portfolio. Lots of people have engaged with their countryside, with nature, with walking, with cycling in a way they haven't done before. So I'm really keen to lock in uh, that behaviour and those people that looked to use their independent butcher and their independent fruit and veg shop. Um, we want to keep uh, that behaviour locked in. So we're looking at ways we can do uh, that. Obviously, the reopening of the food service is critical to so many of you. And um, we're looking um, at that. You will have seen the announcement today uh, from Welsh Government around the opening up of, of outside hospitality. But in the, in the longer term, I know from talking to a couple of my own um, constituency restaurants, you know, they're not very keen to open until they can open indoors as well, because they've perhaps only got a small outdoor area and if it rains then they bring staff in and they prepare food you know that might go to waste so I, I absolutely understand um the wantonness to open uh, indoor as well but we've got to be very careful you'll be very aware of the very um cautious and calm approach i think uh welsh government led by the first minister has taken and i have to say in all the sort of um social monitoring that we've done you have got a third of people in wales who are very fearful of anything opening. And then you've got probably, um, I don't know, about 15% of people who don't think we're doing things quick enough. And then you've got the rest who think we are taking the right approach. So I do understand we've asked a great deal of people, particularly people who had to shield uh, very draconian measures uh, that as a government you would never ever want to take. But I think we've done it for all the right reasons. But I do understand we've had a lot of pressure from the hospitality sector and I'm sure uh, you understand that. So that's really all I wanted to say, Andy. Um, I'm happy to pass over now to or to, I, to yourself or to David. And to myself. Yes. Melissa, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, I hope you can all hear and see me. Um, I know that probably you won't be too worried about not seeing me, um, but I track the problem to my internet down to my two children being on their iPads and my wife on a conference call. So they've duly been evicted. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me now. So thank you, Minister, and uh, hopefully you can join us for the whole hour. Yes, I'm here for the whole hour. Brilliant. That's lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Great. OK, thank you very much for the, the introduction there. I'd like to pass over now to David Lloyd and Martin Jardine. So I'm sure you will know these fine gentlemen. Uh, David Lloyd is Director of Food Industry Centre in Cardiff, and Martin is Director of the Agri-Food Centre up in Menai. Um, gentlemen, we'd like to pass over to you. I think you're going to do a bit of a double act, um, but importantly to everybody, um, David and Martin are becoming the implementation of the rules, the necessary precautions that we need to take, communication and corrective actions that we feel appropriate. So, uh, David and Martin, over to you. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, we're going to do it in that order and um, we're going to just talk through my role to, to start with is talk through implementing the rules. Um, um, the Minister was correct in saying we are a sector that's kept working throughout this, which is quite unusual in itself. Um, we did an, a, a survey and analysis early in the uh, COVID crisis 
um, just as furlough was coming in. And um, and at that point, over 70 percent of the sector was still working, admittedly some working more than they had and some working at 50 percent and obviously some um, having closed the factory uh, for, for a temporary period. So we know that the virus is a live host um, and that people are the main focus. And so the rules quite evidently will focus on people. Um, and those rules really look at uh, asking the industry to take all re re reasonable measures um, to maintain a physical distance. But we're used to that type of rule, um, which quotes all reasonable measures. The food industry works on a, on a legal defence of due diligence, um, which very much is based on all reasonable measures. Um, we're used to dealing with risks and hazards associated with food. Um, this is more complex as we now have, of course, a mobile hazard in primarily people. Um, HACCP has been for decades our part of our cornerstone of our due diligence defence. And we have that research and experience over decades. Um, this, of course, this virus and this uh, this crisis has given us just weeks uh, and just a few months um, to work up our, our research and um, our defence. And we know, though, from discussions with industry um, that our partners have been very active in developing those reasonable measures, in developing the controls within their sites. Uh, to ensure that this isn't a widespread problem. Um, and we know that there are nearly a thousand food companies in Wales, and at the moment we're dealing with three outbreaks. And what we are looking to do is to minimise the potential of, uh, of any more happening. So we're going to talk to you more on the type of things that we can do. Now, um, we're talking about reasonable measures and, uh, and, and physical distancing, but... Um, Within Welsh Government documents, you'll see that other actions um, may be relevant if, it, if physical distancing is more difficult. And to give you an example of those other actions, well, hand washing, we know, is a critical element in keeping this virus at bay. Um, and, you know, we should be looking, as we already do, but just to reinforce things like ensuring there's enough hand wash stations, staggering return of work, uh, return to work for workers from breaks, to ensure that uh, there's a there's a, uh, a a calculated flow uh, of personnel waiting for those hand wash stations, increasing the frequency of hand washing and recording it, um, audit the stations to ensure that there's soap uh, and, and cleaning materials. All those are the sort of detail um, that we need to look at. And I think um, Martin's going to uh, to um, link us to the um, Food Innovation Wales website when he speaks. Um, there are other things we can do. Make reporting of COVID systems mandatory within your site so that um, staff know that if they get COVID symptoms to report it immediately, because the uh, sooner that they do, the better, because in reporting then onto the TTP, um, if we can do that immediately, the sooner the clearance, the sooner the back to normality. Um, and it really speed is of the essence there. Um, keep up to date with changing legislation um, and changing guidance. That's very important. We are in a very mobile situation and the need to keep up to date um, with the relevant guidance and legislation is important. And particularly if you're in part of a multinational company with sites inside and outside Wales, because it's important that uh, multinational companies in their head office, wherever they are, understand that there are Wales specific rules. We've got to guard against COVID blindness. We are four months in now. Uh, we can't afford as a sector to be blind or complacent to this. Um, we have to keep on top of it. And the potential thought process is there in terms of audit and training and retraining. We need to set the culture within each organisation um, to make sure that we try to beat this. And uh, it's important to encompass the whole site. And I know Martin's going to go on to talk about um, a team approach to this. Um, but implementation of the rules and various things we can do underneath it, critical. I'm going to over, hand over now to Martin Jardine, who's head of the uh, Food Technology Centre at College Landry Flomeni in Anglesey. Thank you, David. Um, great, thanks for that. Yes, yeah, so um, just, just before I go into the section I'm going to cover, obviously um, we have a, a massive affinity to the food sector <coughs> within Food Innovation Wales and 
but we're aware of the the challenges that people face and we are we are sympathetic that we appreciate how difficult it is um just firstly as well that we you know we're clear that the large majority of businesses already do have excellent controls in place so um we, we take this from a very respectful point really so it's very much about sharing some good practice from our technologists based at the three sites um, and what industry have, have taught us, quite frankly. So we hope for the information we share will assist in sort of developing your own systems. So I'm going to work through really looking at precautions. So naturally, obviously, everybody's keen to take precautions to mitigate the transmission of the virus between staff. So hopefully some of these ideas that should come through now, will you're probably well aware of, but it's important to reinforce them. So some good practice we've seen is where businesses have been able to establish unique teams of people where they are on the same shift pattern, which reduces exposure. Perhaps something to consider if it's possible to establish teams or pods or people that can routinely work on the same shift. Um, another important factor to drill down on is the movement and the congregation of people, especially in communal areas, break rooms, canteens, looking at these areas where people can congregate, such so as clocking in areas, hand washing station, as David mentioned, and again, it'd be prudent to carry out additional cleaning of those areas. Um, another area to consider is, is, is to possible to, if at all, it limit unnecessary movement within sites. So considering process flows and how different parts of the business engage with one another, ideally eliminating risks rather than managing around them. So if it can't be eliminated, try and keep systems that have been introduced quite simple and keep them easy to use. So. Some businesses we've looked, looked at have managed to segregate time really effectively, um, looking at specific tasks and carrying out careful planning regarding visitors to sites and when contractors are on site and where possible, you know, establishing times that minimise contact or, or even better still, done in, entirely remotely. Um, in some cases, an opportunity to, to evaluate the model that the site works on. So it could be possible to extend the working day to reduce the numbers on shift or spread site attendance, especially for uh, non-production staff with the correct technology, they might be able to work really effectively from home. And again, it's just thinking about the consideration to reduce the numbers uh, uh, on site. So a piece of work that Food Innovation Wales has, in Food Innovation Wales has done is developed a, a toolkit to support the sector. And it's very, imply, uh, very applied and offers uh, you know, a whole series of templates that can be downloaded and adapted to suit specific businesses. So Mark, I'm not sure if you can pop that into the chat now, the link to that, but you know, we'd certainly urge everybody to have a look at that. But um, it does come with a caveat that these are guidelines and they do need to be altered to ensure that they're specific for your site and fit for purpose. You know, I really must stress that it isn't a case of just simply um, downloading them. Um, they're, they're there to be adapted and, and molded to your site. David, did you want to add anything around the toolkit? Yeah, it, the um, the toolkit um, has been successful to date. We've been developing it as we go along. So it's a, it's a very um, live uh, website so that as um, as we learn more, we add more. And as uh, things change from government, we change, we change it accordingly. Um, there's been three and a half thousand hits on it. And the dwell time on there is, um, is suggesting that it is used significantly, not just in Wales, but outside Wales, and both by multinational companies and by um, local health authorities. Um, there's a variety of documents within it. Um, last time I looked, there were at least 28 documents and there are things like an action plan template. So as you take actions, um, there's a template that you can fill in. Um, there's an observation checklist, um, checklist which you can take onto the factory floor as a guide and for also to you to expand on um, because there, there's no two sites the same. Um, there's a return to work questionnaire critical um, with the things that we've talked about and how the virus spreads. And I particularly like the site map guide, um, which guides you through um, looking at the process flows of, of, uh, of people, um, of waste and, and product and packaging, and allows you then by using the, the thought process there to identify hotspots where people might be coming closer together. So you can you can plan your way out of it. But there are a whole series of things in there, even a PPE supplier list to help you um, if you are in need of PPE urgently. Um, it, it also helps companies who've gone through a shutdown during furlough, but who are starting up because we mustn't forget in this that um, food safety is a, a very important issue to the sector as well. One or two food safety 
problems within the sector can also have a dramatic impact on the whole sector. So it's very important when going back into a site um, that, um, that we look at the food safety implications and there are guides for that as well. So please do have a look at it. But as Martin says, there are guides and they're a starting point um, for um, your all reasonable precautions. Um, but you need to add to it on site and we'd be willing to help you um, with that development. Thank you, David. OK, so um, as, as David just said, encouraging everyone really to put time aside to look at that. Um, and it's nice to see in the chat that there's some positive feedback on that. So thank you for that. So communications is the next next part of what we're going to just um, pu push through, really. And again, you know, it's a critical element around preventing spread from person to person. So no doubt, you know, everyone's aware of the diversity within food manufacturing teams. And perhaps a, a possible piece of work is to map the languages of preference of staff um, where possible, um, arranging for documents to be translated. So they're in the language that is understood and those messages are, are nice and clear. But so obviously that said, um, visual aids are particularly effective, aren't they, for, for all staff. So um, we also recognise that, you know, bringing in cultural change and changes to the way people go about their daily business is, is quite often in the sector the hardest thing to, to implement. So, you know, we're all accustomed to working in a certain way and I think sometimes that de-learning is, is, is difficult. So again, it could be quite a useful time to review um, training plans, introduce any refresher training now, and further down the line, plan to reinforce and consolidate messages around the ex expected behaviour. And I think that would be quite useful if uh, anyone has you know training plans in place. Um, a clear one that's coming through uh, across lots of the sites is dialogue with staff is, at this stage is really important so as they feel supported and uh, you know we'd encourage that that two-way communication to being set up even even more so than it perhaps existed already um, we've seen some some companies have set up um, covid champions that encourage and guide staff regarding correct use of ppe hand washing and just general expected behaviors and then that role also acting as a named person to feedback on any staff concerns, because obviously not all staff within the, in the business might feel equipped to do this. And I think there's something quite supportive in, in that, that action. So it's important that staff are aware that they have responsibility to follow the measures themselves. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm, we're not experts in track, trace and protect system, but it might be useful to familiarise yourselves with that. And I'm not sure if Mark has a link that could perhaps go into the the chat at that point but if there is that would be useful if not perhaps that's something that will be sent out separately but in short you know as David alluded to earlier they, these if there are positive results they need to be reported to site as well as the the TTP and worth worth spending some time looking at that and maybe um, setting out to staff that their their obligation to 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 you know attend testing and so on so I'll hand back to David for the the final section of our our parts Turn the mute off. Um, I'm going to uh, finish off by just talking about the corrective action. And if you have a COVID related incident, um, obviously, the, one of the first things to do is inform the, the relevant uh, authorities. Um, and there are links on Food Innovation Wales websites and obviously on FSA websites and HSE websites, Welsh Government websites, um, uh, a link into the relevant authorities. Um, but then it's about taking the right corrective action at the site. And, and those corrective actions, I'm sure, for food, food manufacturers in the audience today, they, they'll be very familiar. Um, and, and there are certain things, you know, that you should go through in the structure of that corrective action, like logging down what was the incident, who was involved in that incident, what action needs to be taken, um, what time frame uh, are we putting on that corrective action, who's responsible for it, um, was the intervention then carried out to the specification, did we do what we said we would do in our um, protocols and is training of staff post that required, what staff are required for training. Um, important part is the verification, did we do it properly and are we still doing something which we put in place? Um, things are easy to slip. Um, and then validation, did it work? Uh, it's very important to, to look at the end point to make sure that the interventions put in place, the actions taken uh, actually have an impact in, in the sites. Um, and, and another important one which is often forgotten is that, at, you know, to define the intervals at which point we go back to establish uh, that um, there is no problem and that uh, the interventions and corrective actions are working. Looking forward, um, the actions, the controls that we put in place are critical to, 
to making a secure sector. Um, there are a myriad of actions that are being taken across the industry. Um, it's not a perfect scientific experiment. We're having to change things very quickly as a sector, and we're not changing one thing at a time. And so we've changed uh, significant uh, controls as a sector over the past four months. Food Innovation Wales is very keen to understand what controls work. Um, so we will be contacting um, all our partners in industry to try and establish what controls are being incorporated and then trying to do some remedial work to understand which controls are working in which sector. Um, and that would be an, a very important piece of work, not just in Wales, I don't think, but um, for food processing um, on a much wider area, because um, that's a very important, uh, it's a very important piece of work to understand the practices that are happening and the impact of those interventions. We need your help on that. We look forward to, to, to working with you um, in the future and doing anything we can to make sure that we keep um, operating and keep growing as an industry so we come out of this um, growing as rapidly as possible. Um, thank you. And, and with that, I think I hand back to Andy. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, David and Martin. I'm very conscious that I've turned my video off and that's because it will make the sound hopefully better. So uh, I think you all know what I look like by now. So it will make the sound clearer. OK, um, so just a, a couple of things. One is we've had a few questions coming in and I will come to those in a second. Um, please, if you've got questions, fire them onto the meeting chat on the right hand side, um, which will be incredibly helpful. So that's the purpose of the next 20 minutes. I would just like to make a, a shout out for a couple of other things. Firstly, I mentioned earlier on the Food and Drink uh, Board Wales newsletter. Um, that's issued weekly. It's a signpost to all of the information. You can get that, but if you look at the chat, it gives you a link that Mark's put up there as to how to sign up for that. And secondly, Mark in a minute will be putting up a link to the Food and Drink Wales website. So if you haven't seen that and don't go to it, again, thoroughly recommend that you do go to it. And finally, I would thoroughly recommend um, connecting with the Food and Drink Federation have a wealth of information. Um, I spend a lot of time working with a uh, number of colleagues there, and they're certainly fighting for our industry as well. So that's a very good source of information. So um, before we open it up to chat questions, I'd like to ask two questions myself. Um, the first one is about communication and language, which I'll ask to David and Martin. And the second, I'd like to ask the minister in terms of speed of reaction um of businesses to any any uh, infections in the in the factory so first one to david and um martin you mentioned communication um how how bad is this sort of language thing within food and drink businesses and what can we do to address it should i start with that so, i mean it's difficult to quantify how bad it is or, or how good it is i think really the the, the message is is to sort of you know, we we have we come from a, a position of doing business bilingually anyway in, in Wales, um, but it's also then just considering what other languages are predominantly used within the factories, and then, you know, working with those groups to make sure that the communications are clear and understood in their language of choice. So, you know, that could be done via you know um, a translator, but of sometimes when it comes purely back from a translator, it misses nuances and regional dialect. So, I would argue that it's involving the people on site as well. So as the nuances of the translation are, are effective for your group, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And just before Dave answers, um, a comment that's coming from Penny was saying, are there, any, are there any useful videos that we can put out to staff? So I think a really good question. So before we go back to David, Martin, just on that one. Not that I'm, well, I, we, we could have a look, but at the moment, I, nothing springs to mind of any, any around communication but i suppose there are um you know there are some some documents that we could probably get our hands on and circulate to this group because david we have got some basic signage haven't we that people are using yes um, um but it's whether it's translated is the question yeah and we or have done at the moment. we have done some work in the past at the university in cardiff with um leatherhead um which has looked at making simple signs that reinforce messages. Um, yeah. there, there is, I mean, it's incumbent on companies 
to if, if employing um, multinational um, teams to to um, to develop the training programs within the languages that people understand. Um, but we found in the past that um, that simple messages around the factory to reinforce those messages are critical. Um, the, the video um, uh, uh, question is uh, is a very good one, and we have just started talking about that within Food Innovation Wales. Um, it might be something we look at um, from Food Innovation Wales viewpoint, um, but we'll we'll look to see what's already available. The the issue comes, I think, to a great degree that um, in the past in the past decades, um, our risk analysis and hazard analysis has been being based on 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 HACCP, which focuses on a static um, static uh, a problem in that you know the, the 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 problem is usually a pathogen on food. Suddenly, we're faced with a very different um, different problem in that the uh, the problem is now mobile and it's yes. related to staff. Um, so the the number of uh, videos um, not necessarily relevant. So there there is it's a very good question and we will look into yeah. that. And, and I, I can also add, you know, I think we've all got to take a point that you know we're in it together, as it were. So if anyone has you know good resources that they think are worthy of sharing, then you know. I think it's important that we we do try and create that culture that amongst the, the businesses and uh, you know we are sharing that information. So please, if anything, if anyone's sitting on any of that, feel free to forward the links to Food Innovation Wales. That's for sure. Okay, lovely. Thank you for your answers and Penny for your <coughs> comment there, um, guys. I'll come back to you in a second with um, Guy's question, which he gave at three fifteen. But firstly, can I just go to to the minister and ask her a question, please, Minister? Um, one of the things we see with um, Leicester is about the information and the speed of reaction um, to any any flare ups, any 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 outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you'd like to comment on there about sort of our agility, our speed of reaction? So I think everybody's different. So if you look at the two outbreaks we've had in North Wales, and, and as I say, I obviously know Rowan Food much better than I know the two sisters. So two sisters closed the plant down themselves. Rowan chose not to. Um, and I think, you know, now we've got 280 plus in Rowan. I think it's something that they do need to consider. Yeah. Um, because clearly, the, you know, they didn't think they were going to have that that number. I spoke to the management very early on. Um, just going back to, to communication and what um, David and Martin were saying. So, again, in Rowan, there's a significant number of agency workers, many of whom are migrant workers, many of whom live in houses of multiple occupation, uh, car share, probably hot bedding. So I think it's about knowing your workforce as well. So there is a, a large permanent workforce at Rowan, but there's also a, a significant number. I think it's about 500 of agency workers. So I think it is really important that things are done in languages. Now in Wrexham, it's predominantly Portuguese and Polish. Now in Merthyr, where we've had the um, uh, the uh, incident there, I know there's about six languages. So uh, they were looking for a, somebody to put the communication into Bulgarian the other day, and I think the local authority stepped up to help there. So it is, it is about reacting quickly and, and not necessarily, I'm not saying you know, Rowan should have closed down. You know, I'm not in a position to make that judgment, but clearly two sisters in Llangevny did. We haven't seen the the level of positives in um, in Keepak, and they've chosen obviously to remain open. Welsh Government have got the army dealing with the um, testing at the moment. So last Saturday, uh, Keepak uh, managed to get, I think it was 850 out of the 900 employees in to be tested on a Saturday, which is excellent. Mm. And obviously, you know, we supported that with, with the military. And I, I do hear that some people are actually paying for their employees to be tested as well, uh, which is an interesting move. Yeah, absolutely. And some factories I know have uh, bought in their own tests. Um, we, we wouldn't encourage that. We've got plenty of tests, or certainly the last time I asked, we had. So, you know, please don't don't think you have to do that. There are plenty of tests available. That's not an issue at all. So um, it, it's and it's important that the tests are of the correct, um, you know, standard sure. to be able to to be of, of use. Again, we've had like, we've had companies who have brought tests that haven't been suitable. So please, you know, we have got plenty of tests as a government. So 
if that's what you need to do, please please take advantage. That's great to know. And also the message I picked up from what you said there was about knowing your workforce and know your workforce mm -hmm. supply chain. Yeah, that's critical. And uh, you know, um, I'm certainly not in a position to lecture everybody about their supply chains, but uh, now is so important and it's the danger of assumptions, isn't it? So thank you, Minister, for your, uh, your comments there. Um, can we go back to um, Guy's question? Guy, um, you were first in very patient at the beginning. Um, and Guy was asking, um, has there only been partic any particular factor identified as being the catalyst for the C19 outbreaks at Key Foods, Two Sisters and Rowan Food? So can I pass that one to Dave and Martin, please? Um, well, um, sorry to dodge the answer, but um, we, we wouldn't necessarily be party to that information. Yeah, Andy. perhaps I'd, I'd be better, actually, Andy. OK, okay thank you. Yeah. yeah, so so clearly one of the issues is around being able to maintain the, say, the social distance. And clearly that was something that was raised with me as minister when we put the two metres into legislation. We're the only country in the UK to do that. Um, we did it so that employers had, had to... Uh, make sure that they were doing everything they could to allow uh, their employees to be two metres apart. Now, again, you know, I mentioned about Rowan, there's lots of misinformation, but certainly I've been told that it's been really difficult uh, to do that. Obviously, um, food process or meat processing, uh, which actually Rowan isn't. Rowan is, is um, uh, tends to be ready meals and food, food preparation. Um, they're cold. There's lots of stainless steel, so now we know the virus can live approximately up to uh, 72 hours on cold uh, surfaces such as stainless steel. Out in the sun, uh, it lasts a minute and a half. So there's a big difference. And I think, again, as, as scientists look at um, the length of time the virus can live, then, you know, for winter and, and the cold um, environment, is it, you know, that is clearly of concern. But I think... You know, that's that's something that we need to be aware of. But as I say, if people are, <coughs> excuse me, if people are coming in, you know, they're car sharing. So it's about encouraging that culture uh, within your workforce, you know, to understand that, you know, car sharing, you shouldn't be uh, two metres apart. Then again, if you live in a house of multiple occupation mm. and, you know, I've got some in Wrexham where I know there are 14 people living in one house yeah. with uh, three bedrooms, but it's very hard to self-isolate. Yeah. So, you know, you can see why. Um, factories with the, this, you know, the large number of employees that the two in North Wales have had. Um, but then we've seen other food processing plants that have had none at all. So yeah. I would say, you know, that the message to be uh, pushing forward is the social distance and, and, the, and the hygiene. Can, can I add a point there to, to Guy's question as well? You know, you, you rightly say that food processing has, has continued. The survey work we did through Food Innovation Wales, that it, it suggests that 72% of the sector continue to trade, albeit at lower levels, but they still remained open. Now, if you look at where we sit, I mean, I can only recall the figures for North Wales, but there are roughly 22, 23,000 people due to return from furlough to, to other industries. Um, and as the minister alluded to earlier, they'll be looking to the food sector for, for some good practice. But... You know, the, I think the point you, in your question, you know, the fact that we have traded and have stayed open, you know, there is there is an element of it that there's a, the laws of probability would tell you that there's potential because there's, you know, more people in work. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. I hope that answered your question, Guy. If not, uh, please feel free to come back on the, uh, on, on the chat. Um, one thing I do want to ask everybody on the call, our guests, uh, what I'd love to know is what is the one thing that you would like us to do now in terms of helping you to manage coronavirus outbreaks? I don't want to hear about loads of the other issues that might be we've got floating around at the know. I'd be very interested to know is what will you need us to do? You've got the minister, you've got two experts, you've got the food and drink board on the call. Please, can you let us know what your thoughts are, are on that? Um, Mark very kindly has posted the Welsh Government guidance on the chat for the prevention and management of coronavirus in food and meat plants. So, OK, um, so a question coming in from Tony. Will UV light help to kill the virus? I think maybe that would be David Martin. Um, there's a variety of um, novel decontaminations uh, being used to look at this particular virus. The problem is, that, of course, that this virus is so relatively new. Um, so across the world, there are a variety of scientific experiments going on, looking at anything from 
actual humidity to relative humidity to UV to ozone, um, all of which looking at the efficacy. Um, the fact that um, the, the virus has a um, fatty lipid outer layer um, would make me think, and this is not, um, this isn't based in science, um, would make you think that um, a good detergent um, would be um, a critical element in the cleaning process uh, because that would disrupt the, um, the, the virus, um, followed by um, a good sterilizer or disinfectant. So, um, so you know, basic uh, cleaning methods will be um, important. And in going back to my ooh, long, long days of, uh, of looking at this, you know, physical, chemical and heat energy um, are all quite important, um, particularly the physical energy as well. But um, detergents, I would say, are, are critically important in this, uh, as is a disinfectant at the end. I, I don't think we can speak specifically on UV. Well, I can't for this particular virus because it is uh, relatively new. It might be worth tracking back UV work on other coronavirus, but um, of course you can't be sure that that's the same because it's a different structure. Okay, thank you. Just to add to that, I think personal view, um, not necessarily getting into the EUV debate, but I think you know it's 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 limiting the human transmission to me is the the, the element around it. The other, the other thing we have got, um, just thought while I'm speaking, I'll mention it, we have got um, a hotline that Food Innovation Wales has established. Um, so there is a number there that companies can call and, and have some of these conversations offline if, if they so wish. So again, worth looking at the Food Innovation Wales website and there are there are numbers there that people can pick up dialogue with as well. And that, and that, that actually on the, uh, on the chat, Mark, if you've got time to do that. Sorry, David. And that allows us to better research because um, one of the, and I am digging back in my memory here, but one of the other restricting factors on UV was that um, it looks at the surface that it's seeing at the time. So if you're shining it on top of a table and the coronavirus is under the table, um, then it wouldn't necessarily have an impact there. So... Um, uh, yes, it, it, we, we'd be better taking it through the hotline and researching that question and feeding back to the gentleman or lady, but um, they're the initial thought processes. And okay, that's very good. Thank you. Um, just can I go to some questions here about masks and visors, because there's been two or three coming in, and may have I perhaps ask a sort of collective question, which I hope represents our guest views here, is um, what would be the guidance on using masks and visors um, where it's not possible to follow the social distancing guidelines? I know there are, you know, there's a few situations that I, I'm aware of and we all know on a practical situation. Um, certainly, you know, I see in England a lot of people wearing visors where they can't socially distance. So I'd be interested that either the Minister or Martin or um, David's view on that, please. So Welsh government's advice is, is to wear uh, a face covering if you can't if you can't social distance. And I have to say, certainly, you know, locally in the supermarkets, there's a lot more people wearing uh, face coverings now. But I think the the point that David made about around hand washing and detergents and soap. I know you were talking about, you know, a factory or um, a premises surface. But again, that's the message that's coming from certainly from the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer to us as ministers is that hand washing is, you know, absolutely imperative. And, you know, if you can't social distance, wear a face covering. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, one of the one of the reasons behind the, the last request in, in our presentation, Andy, was that we can think of 60, 60 70 questions to ask about factory four operations. Um, what we need to do is to gather the information, as much information from as many companies as possible to establish, you know, who wears masks, who doesn't wear masks, who use high pressure hoses, who doesn't use high pressure hoses, uh, who's got um, who's got uh, return to work forms, who hasn't, and then and then try and mine that data to establish what controls work. I think as well with the masks, I mean, just on a, a broader point, really, I think if it, if it makes people feel safer um, and it can be done in a way that they're not going to create a physical hazard in the factory then I think it'd be a positive thing. Um, I don't know whether you're seeing the comments coming in here, but there's more comments coming about whether masks will be effective in cold, damp environments. 
Um, and, and likewise, they can be constrictive in a very hot environment. So I, I guess, you know, you can't win in those situations. So uh, I think rather than put it to the um, to, to the panel, I think we'll just move on from that. It's a very, very important point. Um, I, mean, I, I think also, if I can just say, it's really important to differentiate between masks and face coverings, mm. mainly because masks, uh, you know, there was lots of noise around, or we can't have masks because, you know, the NHS and social care sector need them. So that's why we've been very particular talking about masks and, and face coverings, just to be pedantic. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm assuming availability of masks is there. Um, I would just be interested in people's comments on the chat, whether you find you can have access to mask visors, etc. So just in a few minutes we've got left, just ping in your comments, please. Um, this Andy, can I just add a point there that Food Innovation Wales has done some work around the suppliers of PPE and on the Food Innovation Wales website, there is a list of suppliers and contact addresses. So if people are struggling, that might be a useful starting point. OK, brilliant. Thank you. I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, quick answers, I think, to these because we're getting a few coming in now. Are there any guidance for the correct use of temperature monitoring on entrance to establishments? Um, and secondly, we'll do it together. This one is any evidence of transmission via food. OK, so two parts of that. Um, can I do the food bit? OK, the temperature uh, one. <laughs> the, um, we, we, we obviously keep abreast of um, research and um, health centres across the world. Um, we use the Centre for Disease, Disease Control in Atlanta a lot, um, and both themselves and the FSA say that, uh, I think the quote is, very unlikely because the virus needs a live host. Um, the minister just talked about um, survival on smooth surfaces of up to 72 hours. Um, there's the potential for packaging, but it's not. we're not sure. Um, but on food, um, the major centres for disease control in the world are saying that it is very unlikely. Yeah, good. Well, that's, that's very reassuring because the last thing we need is a food crisis. Mm. OK, and thank you for the answers there. And just coming back to there's a few comments coming back in. It'll appear that masks have been um, reasonably available, but actually visors, no. So I think really, you know, we've run out of time for this section. But if you're struggling to get hold of visors and that is widespread and represented, please can you let us know? Uh, because, again, we can't do anything unless we know. OK. OK, um, I think we'll begin to put together. Um, I just want to look and actually see there was one more. Um, there's a question that's coming from Lydia, and I'm just trying to paraphrase and read at the same time. So um, there have been media coverage of outbreaks which have been significantly damaging to local opinion of food companies and therefore the recruitment of local people. Um, I think the point here from Linda's mate, we need to really be very careful about our reputation. And that was the point, Lydia, that I was saying right at the beginning, you know, of course we've got to stop people getting infected, but actually we've got to make sure our food and drink sector stands up to scrutiny. You know, that's the one thing I'm proud of as Welsh food and drink is its integrity, um, its provenance and its quality. So you're absolutely right. And I think that's the whole purpose of what we're doing here. We're the first devolved nation, in fact, the first country in the UK to, to run this kind of event. Um, and I'm not summing up yet, by the way, but what I would like to say is if you found it useful, please, please let us know. Um, and we're very happy to do more of these events if, it, if it's helpful. So, OK, good. Um, actually, there was one last question I'll ask before I just ask Leslie for any final comment. Um, from Guy again, uh, you're on good form today, Guy. Are there any learnings from the US and German food processing outbreaks that we need to learn from um i think i think what we've already talked about um controls within within um sites um are critical for our understanding we're in the very early phases of an emerging um uh, a problem here and uh, the sooner we can get real data back on controls from the from the sites the the sooner we understand what the critical factors are in, in it entering sites. Um, I, I think that's the best answer you can give on that. Yeah, yeah. I think being appreciative of, of the speed it moves, I will just pick up that, that temperature question there that, that um, Sabina put in the chat. We, we never answered that. But if you've gone back two months ago, it, it seemed a really, really positive response from the scientific community around temperature testing. Yet more recent papers are suggesting that, you know, it, it's 
it's dubious at best as to whether or not it has any any um, scientific standing. So I just think that's the point. Really. It is moving very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I'm not going to put this as a question, but I just noticed that actually uh, um, um, about reporting, um, it just flagged in my mind that the importance of reporting, you only manage what you can measure. Um, and there was something there about maybe how we report and what we ask businesses to report back on. So, OK. Listen, um, I know there have been lots of questions coming in. I'm very, very grateful. Um, trust me, when you chair these and it's like the tumbleweed moment, it's not very easy. So thank you very much for um, your questions coming in. Um, what we will do is we haven't lost those chats. Um, we will send these back to you. We'll record those all so people have got it. We will make sure that you've got the links that actually Mark's been putting up um, on the right hand side. We will send those around to you again. But again, you know, please, 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 perhaps the key source of information, Food and Innovation Wales website, Food and Drink website, Food and Drink Federation, and the weekly uh, Food and Drink sec um, Board, Welsh Food and Drink Board newsletter. You know, they're all succinct bits of information. Um, we really do want to know from you guys what you need. So please keep the conversation going. Before I sum up, actually, um, Melissa, would you, is there anything you'd just like to say as final parting words? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. We'll just say a, a big thank you to uh, to David and Martin for doing this survey for us. And I know they've got some ideas to uh, kind of expand on, on that review. Um, thank you to you all for, for your attendance. It's great to see so many people on it and so many people keen um, to learn lessons from other people and share that good practice. Um, it is a very novel virus and we're learning about it all the time. And, um, you know, it's somebody, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the Michael McIntyre little video about he pretends he went to see a clairvoyant in June 2019 and he's telling uh, Mike, Michael McIntyre what his life will be like in 12 months. And it's really unbelievable the speed that this um, all, all took over. So I know we've all had to adapt to new ways of working. Um, but it is really important that we protect ourselves and obviously employees. Um, as I said, the, there's lots of information out there. I'm grateful for everybody uh, who's brought it together. I'm very happy to, to, to do another one of these. We've put it together really, I think it was at 10 o'clock last Thursday night, Andy, uh, and I had a telephone conversation about doing this. So thank you to everyone who's made that uh, possible. You'd never get nearly 200 people in the same room from all over Wales. So, you know, there is the that's the upside of being able to do things um, on technology. So, um, you know, really difficult time for us. And um, I think the important thing is to say, and I think somebody said it in the chat before, this is two outbreaks and an incident in three places. And, you know, you've all worked throughout it. It was really important that we had food on our tables. You've made sure that's that's been possible. And so the focus has been on this sector, but there will be lots of learning to do. I think it was Martin that said about 22 and a half thousand people of furloughed. So when, you know, the manufacturing goes back, um, you know, later on this month or next month, they will be looking uh, to us for that best practice. So, uh, you know, thank you very much. And if anybody's got any questions, as Andy said, we'll pick up all the questions and we'll make sure we get back to you. But everybody knows my email address. Um, you know, please do send your thoughts or questions. But thank you all very much uh, for your attendance. And thanks to Andy and Martin and David in particular. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Minister. And obviously, formally to thank you for taking an hour out of your very busy schedule. So thank you very much for that. Um, thank you very much to Dave and Martin for your very wise words. And just a final summarise for me in the last one minute is to say, Firstly, we've got to make sure that we stand up to scrutiny in Wales. You know, we're all very proud of our industry. I'm sorry, I think, guys, you're going to be our poster boy now for your comments. But you said, thank you, Team Wales. And that fundamentally, that's what it's all about. You know, we're in this together and you know, we should be very proud of what we're achieving together. Ultimately, for me, it's about attention to detail. It's about having the right advice and information. And it's about having the right agility. That's what it's all about. So. Thank you very much for all our guests for taking the trouble. I think that actually we've had a record number. Over 110 people have stayed with us. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.